Welcome to Coaching Uncaged by Animas, the podcast that explores the art, science and career of coaching. And now introducing your host and interviewer, Yannick Jacob. Shemaine Rush, welcome to the podcast. It's so nice to have you. Hello, Yannick. Nice to be here, I think. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Well, let's see. We never know, right? We live in the uh, <laughs> uncertainty of life and living, and uh, we've met for the we're meeting for the first time. Indeed. Yes. Although I've so, seen your name around, I have seen you. Yeah. Likewise. Um, I mean, you've done you've done a lot, and you've done so much important work, and you are in a space that is particularly important, I think, right now in this day and age that we live in, and there's a lot of movement. I mean, you don't just bring 30 years of experience in education. Uh, you've worked with a lot of organizations. Um, your, what, what seems to have emerged as a dominant theme in your work is the decoloniality as a systemic lens, uh, anti-racism, uh, looking at oppression, power, uh, diversity within the coaching industry, but also within organizations, but also within life as a whole in the system we live in. Mm -hmm. Um, you've uh, published a couple of really important pieces of work. Uh, for me, first and foremost, that uh, report you've done with Jonathan Passmore. Um, um, and uh, you, you're still doing your PhD, right? So this is a part of a much, much bigger project uh, around um, the, the ethics of coaching for social change in oppressive contexts. Yes. So there's, there's a lot there. Oh, you've cool. You've published in the Philosophy of Coaching magazine, which I really like, uh, um, the journal. Uh, you ran your own podcast, Speak Up, Speak Out, Ethics Matter. Um, you're an executive coach, you're a coaching supervisor. You do a lot of work in that space. I wonder by means of getting to know you, what else might be helpful for the audience to know about where you're speaking from? Uh, could be a bit of your story, could be important pieces of work that you think uh, really help. Um, how else can we get to know Shemaine? It's mm, an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, well, if I start from where I'm sitting now, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all those things that women get, well, some women choose to be. Um, I'm a mother, a grandmother, a wife, a sister. Um, a daughter and all of those things kind of concertina together to make me very invested in I think as as we all are in um how we evolve on this planet um so particularly that link with my grandchildren I feel a huge sense of responsibility for mm. You know, if you like being a, a midwife of the future for mm. for and with them mm. um and with them because they are active agents i mean even my my youngest grandchild who's like six months old oh, i have a one-year-old they're active <laughs> agents all right very active, agent. <laughs> very active agents so um i'm not trying to to um diminish the you know the agency that they will grow into for themselves mm -hmm. but um it's about legacy and about ancestry. Mm -hmm. And that links me back, I guess, to my, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a migrant in England. Um, my parents migrated here to um, the UK in the 60s, 1962, when I was two years old. And because of that, uh, from Jamaica, so, and I mentioned that because there was the 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 Windrush. You may have heard of the Windrush scandal, where Windrush generation um, West Indians were being deported back to mm -hmm. the West Indies mm -hmm. because they were no longer able to prove their right to mm -hmm. live here. Mm -hmm. um, papers that they that had been in existence that were the state was responsible for had been destroyed, um, and because of sometimes a sort of an underlying fear of interactions with the state people hadn't mm -hmm. got themselves um their papers um so um when the hostile environment arrived uh, at the home office a lot of people became vulnerable and mm -hmm. um some are still being deported 
So despite the fact that I've lived here since I was two years old, even in my 60s, there's a sense of precarity about yeah. I've got a British passport, I'm a British citizen, I'm a naturalised citizen. Um, but I do feel that sense of precarity and I don't want future generations to inherit yeah. that sense of pre precarity. So, you know, um, I think that that migration story is very much part of of who I am because it's made me very sensitive to mm -hmm. the marginalised, those who are disadvantaged for structural reasons, uh, systemic reasons. It gives you a heightened sense of awareness oh, yeah. and consciousness and empathy, you know, mm. compassion. Oh, yeah. I feel I've always brought to my work, whether as a teacher or yeah. as a coach or supervisor, you know, whatever yeah. roles. Mother. I, mean, <laughs> I, I can feel it now already, that wave of compassion. I haven't lived that kind of story. For me, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a psychologically pretty safe environment. I mean, I had my own struggles, of course, within family and within mm. the system that I live in, but it's nothing compared to someone of your standing still feeling that precariousness about, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I've always trusted the state. You know, up until I was probably in my mid 20s, 30s, mm. and uh, I developed a bit more of a systemic lens. Mm. Uh, but I also in Germany, as a you know middle aged white male, uh, the system is more or less on your side. Yeah. So uh, it, it's very different, and yet I feel it, right? Yeah. So no wonder uh, that that personal groundedness in your relationship with power and uh, and that systemic lens of what this can do to people as a embodied lift story is yeah, i can yeah. feel it yeah and i think i think what i would like to stress though is that i don't feel at any time that has made me a victim mm. i don't i don't feel like a victim of the system um it's this curious thing and it links it links back to it links into the research that i did um when we interviewed when i interviewed the coaches um for the the um, the report you refer to, racial justice, equity, and belonging in, in coaching. Um, the testimony of those coaches spoke to this sense of power mm -hmm. <laughs> that you gain power from seeing and experiencing systems that are um, oppressive and marginalizing. Mm -hmm. um, you you resist <laughs> you um you are you adapt and you resist um mm -hmm. and um you you decide well i think with a level a level of consciousness you decide decide the, de the the degree of adaptation um but sometimes you get lulled into adaptation and the reason why i i want to mention that is you know i experienced the the death of the murder the murder of george floyd in a very visceral way, along with millions of other people across mm -hmm. the globe, because I had been lulled into a sense of um, safety. I guess I was, you know, mm. I, as I sit here, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm taking my teacher's pension. Um, I don't have a mortgage. Um, I can afford to heat my home. I don't worry about food. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can afford to look after my my relatives, my my mom, my children, if they need support financially, I'm in inverted commas because you never know what can happen. I'm yeah. secure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but when the news of George Floyd's murder um arrived during the pandemic, and um in that space where we were all extra vulnerable, mm -hmm. it was a huge sh psychological shock. It was mm -hmm. traumatizing. And it reminded me that I was black mm -hmm. because at that point in my life, I wasn't particularly sitting there thinking about my blackness. Mm -hmm. um, and that sense of um, vulnerability really came. It really opened up that reopened that sense of vulnerability, which I probably hadn't felt since I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a difficult time growing up in in england during this during the 60s 70s it's very difficult for uh people of color black people mm -hmm. and people of color um yeah so 
that sense of um, precarity, despite also a sense of strength and owning um, my set, my agency. It's that con- you know that you have that dual, yeah, that dual, um, that dual thing going on. Yeah, can I jump in there with something? Um, because in the beginning of that report that you mentioned, um, you talked about that you found a certain color blindness in the coaching industry. And you just said you were sitting there not particularly thinking about your blackness. Mm. I've, I've heard that from a lot of coaches. And at some point, I, I thought like, oh, this is a really good thing, isn't it? That I don't really notice color or differences or, you know, my... Uh, I had a bunch of situations where I realized that people that I've spent a lot of time with were so obviously gay and I hadn't, I hadn't noticed or I hadn't thought about it. Mm. Um, and I'm, I thought in the beginning, well, that's a really, it's not a really good thing or is that a really concerning thing? Mm. Um, so what would you say to someone who says, well, isn't it good that we don't see color? Because it's, it's very important that we notice what's going on out there in terms of oppression and race. So could you speak a bit in, into that space, especially in the context of your experience of not thinking so much about my blackness, but then something really shook me. Mm. Yeah, I could answer that from so many different perspectives. Mm. So, you know, if I go wandering around, <laughs> just um, <laughs> direct me back to somewhere. So I think what, what, what I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with what I mean by blackness. Mm-hmm. Um, and and right. maybe maybe if we if it helps we can always put a focus on why is this relevant to coaches maybe indeed yeah, yeah absolutely yes so what i mean by blackness is i remember deciding that i was black mm-hmm. um and this was in my 20s um i i became in, involved in the um the anti apartheid movement Mm-hmm. Um, along with a lot of people on the left, I was I was a socialist. I identified as a as a, as a socialist, um, and um, quite a left wing socialist. I, I used to read Marx and Engels and Lenin and Trotsky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and the, I then I encountered the work of Steve Biko and learned about black consciousness. Mm-hmm. And it was the work of Steve Biko and the Black Consciousness Movement that made me decide that I was black. Mm-hmm. So blackness as a, to me as, a, as identity. Color. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. As a political and social identity. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't about it. Well, obviously, it's about skin color mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because um, it's it's a re- it's a response, if you like, to racism mm-hmm. um, and it's owning so blackness, the blackness was first a label of inferiority mm-hmm. and black consciousness reframed that into mm-hmm. a positive. Um, I think it was Steve Biko who framed the term black is beautiful. Mm. Um, and he was saying that not all black people are liberated um, from uh, racism until they can fight the internalized the internalized picture of themselves as inferior so it, it oppression becomes internalized as a subjective sense of inferiority um the phrase black is beautiful is a resistance to that so that you you resist that internalizing that picture of yourself as an inferior mm-hmm. being um and that is what I refer to as blackness. It's a form of consciousness. Mm-hmm. It's a position. It's a way of being in the world. Um, and I say, and I want to stress that because I would say that for my daughters, blackness is something else. It's more, it's more cultural. It's more to do with culture, family, um, a sense of belonging in community. Whereas for me, it is specifically that political and social consciousness. Mm-hmm. And my cultural identity is something different mm-hmm. from that. It's, it's, it's a distinctly different quality. Um, so I guess it was more that black consciousness that I was reminded of. I was reminded that I was a black person with a social 
res- and political responsibility to mm. resist mm-hmm. and not just live. Um, you know, there's, there's this phrase, and again, I can't even remember where it's from, but the, the, un- the unexamined life isn't worth living. That might be a very bad paraphrase. But I may have been in a phase of my life at that point where certain aspects of my life were not being examined. Mm-hmm. Um, I was taken a lot for granted. Um, although I was asking questions because it was at the same time I'd only just started my PhD and I was asking questions. But the questions um, hadn't been fully crystallized at that point. Mm. So that moment helped to crystallize a lot of what was at the level of maybe sensation and doubt and um, questions, but not at the level of a crystallized, um, formulated perspective mm. or, or view. Hmm. So I think just, for just me, to, just to yeah, throw can, in I just very, this, sure, can I yeah, just yeah. finish this point? Of course. So um, for me, this thing about s- colour blindness here, it's blindness to systemic realities. Um, one of the things were after George Floyd was murdered that made me feel safe. So I went from feeling very safe to very unsafe. People in my community, I live right in rural Nottinghamshire. I live in a, a little market town in the middle of rural Nottinghamshire. I'd been feeling very safe. Then I suddenly felt unsafe. And people started to put posters up in their windows saying Black Lives Matter and mm. and it made me feel safe again. Mm. So the fact that they were recognising mm-hmm. that something needed to be said helped mm-hmm. to make me feel safe. And I think that is the issue. If things aren't being acknowledged, if mm-hmm. we're living in a world where there's systemic racism and racist violence, you know, gender violence, whatever the form of violence it is, if it's not being acknowledged, it makes you feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. So to make people feel safe, you need to acknowledge the reality of Mm -hmm. some of what they might be experiencing. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. you're gaslighting them when you say Mm -hmm. race doesn't matter. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, The thing I wanted to throw in is it made me think about uh, owning identity, right? Blackness as an identity. I see that in a lot of coaches, you might see that as well in supervision, is that there's a point often in a coach's career, where they choose that they're a coach, they're not just doing coaching, they're not just using a coaching skill set, but they're really owning coach as a piece of identity. Um, That's what it made me think of when it was like, I, I choose to be this. This is a, a consciousness is a different thing than, oh, I see your job title or I see your color. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, I th- I'm I, I'm, I'm going to lay that, let that sift around in the back of my head for a minute before I speak directly to it, because. I, do, I, I don't know, I think my relationship to coaching is a bit ambivalent. Oh, how so? It's an interesting question. I'm not. I'm not sure if I've bot- bottomed it yet. But um, so you know, I be- when I became a coach, I just I did. I I'd been coaching for quite a while in the education sector, but I hadn't done a formal qualification. When I left the sector, I um, I I went to Warwick University and did their their coaching diploma, and mm-hmm. fell in love with coaching as a professional activity rather than as a something integrated into other ways mm-hmm. of being like being a manager or a leader or mm-hmm. um and I did fall in love with it quite uncritically um since I've developed a critical lens I have more of an ambivalent relationship mm-hmm. to coaching because I do not think that coach I think I think the naive view of coaching which is the one that I had is that coaching is brilliant irrespective of context type of person as long as they're ready for it and they want it then it's fine it's great it's brilliant it's everybody should be coached Mm -hmm. and coaching can never be the wrong thing to do (laughs) and I don't feel that anymore I don't feel that coaching is a um one size fits all process for everybody at any time and the only issue is readiness of Mm -hmm. the coachee 
Yeah. Could you briefly put a frame around coaching in your perspective? Because there's so many, it could mean so many things, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think for me, coaching is essentially a co it's a co-creative process. So you co-create a space with the person that you're working with in order to look at things, examine, feel your way through, explore, see and decide your relationship to, and then choose what you want to do about whatever it is that you see. Mm -hmm. So as a partner in, in that process, I bring whatever it is that I have in my field, my system, my, my ability to feel and see, to broaden and enhance the, the, that, that journey of seeing, feeling, being of mm -hmm. the person that I'm with. Um, so um, it's, you know, I don't feel that, I feel that all the outcomes of coaching are co-created. They're not, they're not created by me alone and they're not created by my client alone. They're co-created mm -hmm. in the space that we create together. Mm -hmm. um, and that field, you know, I bring my field of experience, knowledge, et cetera. They bring theirs. And some third other thing is created as a result of what we both bring. And that third other thing is if if there is some magic in coaching that that, hmm. that is that is the magic hmm. but i i don't believe that we can do that effectively for everybody in all situations if we're not prepared to think about systemic issues like power mm -hmm. um imbalances of power abuses of power You know, when I was coaching um, in the education sector, and this is where my PhD journey started, um, I left the education sector because of a huge clash in values. I could no longer work in the system because of mm. um, the academization process and what it was doing to uh, the school that, that I was leading at that time. And so I left for existential reasons. Um I then went back into the sector to coach. And what I began to see was that some, I would say all of the people that I coached were manifesting um, that same existential crisis that I was experiencing when, when I left, mm -hmm. which is the system was being driven by values of, of productivity and um, a target-driven, audit-driven mm -hmm. performativity sort of mm -hmm. culture, which was at odds with their more sort of, um, I'd say broadly a sort of social justice kind of set of values, um, certainly more humanistic values than the system, mm -hmm. um, the values of the system that they were in. And there was this clash of values. Now, those people were internalizing that clash as stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. self-doubt, um, sense of failure, a feeling of a need to perform against the standards, which they are actually finding quite painful mm -hmm. to perform against those standards because it distorted their relationship with why they felt they were there for the young people that they were teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and coaching I was called into coach to support their well-being. And I felt that what the coaching was doing was intensifying the internalization of that mm -hmm. conflict as a psychological tr trait that belonged to the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it was theirs to manage, theirs to there's to um self-regulate yeah self-management self-regulation of this internalized expression of yeah. their relationship with the environment they were working in 
Uh, that happens so often. Yeah, and the environment wasn't acknowledged. None mm -hmm. of those systemic issues were being acknowledged. And I felt that that was unethical. And that's where I started to feel the pain or what I've come to call psychological uh, ethical stress. Mm. It's not a term that I've coined. It was coined by another researcher whose work was very influential um, to me. I, I mentioned her. I, in fact, I interviewed her in my podcast. That's Jane Fenton, mm. who ex said the same process was happening in social work. Mm -hmm. um, and can I, sorry, can I just underline the significance of this? Because I see this all the time, not just in my own coaching, but also in the in the coaching of all the coaches that I supervise, almost all the coaches in the super, that you work with someone, especially if it's in an organizational context or in the context of an institution or a, a strong system where the the sponsor of the coaching wants the individual being coached uh, to take responsibility for the solutions. Absolutely. And then the individual is being managed or is expected to manage themselves uh, and adjust to the system. So without that systemic lens of what's actually happening here, um, it's it can be it's possible to work. Right. It's possible to get results. Yeah, but, too. you know, what are we really solving? And I think an awareness of that as a coach mm -hmm. can open doors into the conversation that really needs to be had, but often the much more difficult conversation. And sometimes the conversation that the sponsor of the coaching really doesn't want to no. want to have. Yeah. I'd rather want the individual to like take responsibility for whatever systemic issues they're experiencing uh, and then change the individual rather than the system, because that's much easier. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think coaching can get recruited because of its. It's seeming neutrality, which is not neutrality, but it's seeming mm -hmm. neutrality. It can be it can there's the danger that particularly if you're quite naive and I don't mean that in an insulting way I mean that just to mean if you accept things on face value without looking asking certain systemic questions yeah. um, coach needs to be neutral the coach isn't influencing this uh, you know this is the client brings in the agenda and the coach yeah, you know exactly. that that has that's just being taught at so many coaching schools and it exactly. has been challenged like you write on one yeah. of your excellent yeah. blogs mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's being challenged more and more, I believe, you know. But mm -hmm. it's we're still, we we are still in at the very early days, and there are still coaches who will defend their neutrality. Absolutely, the last. But in some ways, I understand why, mm -hmm. and I think we need to understand why because just condemning neutrality doesn't help. No, no, no anything no. that comes from the place of condemnation does not help. Mm. So, you know, I. What I say is we have to we have the responsibility to, to ask if someone is claiming neutrality, what is your neutrality serving? Mm -hmm. Because in some cases it's serving something quite positive. You mm -hmm. know, for a lot of coaches, it's serving non-judgment a non-judgmental stance. Mm -hmm. It's serving client ag the agency of their yeah. coachee. However, you then have to look at impact because it's impact that matters more than intention. So if your serving of the client um, autonomy means that you never mention the sensation that you get, that they are being bullied, for example. Mm. If you never mention that, if you never mention the fact that you get the feeling that someone is um, using their power in a in an abusive way in relation mm. to them, or they might be using their power <laughs> in an abusive mm -hmm. yeah, way yeah. to someone else. I think that's quite problematic. Yeah, if you feel something very strongly. For the, for the, and absolutely. You're not saying it. It's like I feel inauthentic when I sit on something and I don't give voice to it. I mean, I need to, I want to make sure that this is not my stuff, right? That exactly. this is not reminding me of my brother who always bullied yeah. me, yeah. you know, or is it that particular word? I might feel stronger because of my personal experience. And I'm sure you probably feel stronger because of the story that you've lived about certain situations. Mm -hmm. And it can be a tricky question for coaches to say, well, is this really my stuff or is this generated here? To what extent, mm -hmm. at what's the threshold of me speaking up about this? Exactly. But I think that is where you have to negotiate with your coachee. Mm -hmm. You know, it's and I put this with it in the realm of um, use of self. Um, 
if if you're feeling something very strongly, there are, there are sort of if you like non-directive ways of non-directive ways of of sharing that. So in some instances, I'll say, you know, I'm getting a very strong metaphor, very strong image in my mind. Um, are there any metaphors or images coming to you as you're speaking? And they might share theirs. So I haven't shared mine. I haven't put what I'm thinking onto them, but I'm using that sense of a very strong non-verbal communication coming through Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to give them the space to see if there's anything there present for them. Sometimes I've asked people to draw. Mm -hmm. I've said, you know, I'm getting this really strong image. If I ask you to draw what you're talking about, what would that look like? And that's Mm -hmm. really created huge breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm more directive, I'll say, or more open, if you like. I might say, that feels to me like, and I'll name what it feels like, and I'll then ask, does that resonate with you? Mm-hmm. Um, so I've done that to name racism. I've done that to name misogyny, um, mm-hmm. where a female coachee was being. In fact, she'd been bullied by a previous boss and had in- internalised that. And that internalised relationship with the previous boss was conditioning her relationship to a new boss. Uh-huh. And now, if I had named that, I think what it was, I asked the question, I said, whose voice is that? Because she was, huh. and this is, you know, she was talking about um, the way she was thinking about herself. And I said, whose voice is that? I love that question. And she she then linked it back to this previous boss. Uh-huh. Um, and I said, that sounds like an abusive way of communicating that sounds abusive and Mm -hmm. that's when we got into that conversation um but I think I think it's about offering isn't it it's about offering not telling Mm -hmm. sharing not telling Mm -hmm. and maybe that's the boundary it's not about telling people what they are or who they are or what they've experienced Mm -hmm. it's about sharing something that's coming up for you to see if it illuminates something for them And, you know, if we really believe in the agency of our coach, he will trust them to yeah. know if it's relevant or not. Yeah, and you, you uh, titled the, I'm, I'm, I forgot where I saw it, but you called the supervisor, I think, in this example, but I think it applies to the coach as well, as a seer of patterns, mm-hmm. right? So if you see a pattern of somebody in front of you right. having an authentic voice and then all of a sudden they say something or there's a narrative that sounds not quite like you know them, yeah. You know, not as, not saying like, oh, this is not your voice. Whose voice is this? But mm-hmm. you know, this sounds different. You know, whose yeah. voice is this? It's yeah. uh, making an observation and being curious, yeah. and that can be deeply challenging for people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's guiding the process of inquiry, but it's not directive, as in telling, as you say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, naming oppressions is is really important that you do get the power balance right. You know, we all have power in situations um, and we and, and it is possible to overuse the power of a coach. You know, it mm-hmm. is very possible. It mm-hmm. is very. Um, so being aware of that and, and concerned about that is 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 a good thing. It's a positive thing. So mm-hmm. people who hang on to neutrality for that reason. Yeah. Um, you know, that that is something to not to condemn. However, one has to take a critical view and to, to say, OK, so what is that neutrality serving? Mm-hmm. Is it serving something useful or is it serving mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. that is maintaining something that isn't useful? Mm-hmm. You know, maintaining a, a, an abuse of power or a blind spot or w- whatever it, it might be. So I think yeah. that's the crucial thing for me is yeah. what is it serving and yeah. what is the impact? Yeah. What's and the I, impact? And I think that's so important, right? Because I, I've noticed that a lot and I've asked that question to quite a few of the guests we had on the podcast. Uh, I remember talking to Peter Hawkins and, you know, that there's really this, uh, well, we need to do something about climate change, right? Uh, if if somebody's not engaging in this, then I haven't found a way to engage them. Uh, and I remember challenging that because uh, I had conversations with uh, the founder of the school, Nick as well, Nick Bolton, um, who was like, well coaches as social change agents, you know, is is sitting in contrast with this, well, we're working 
with the client and to support whatever the client wants. And I remember Peter saying, well, we cannot possibly be neutral. It's impossible to be neutral. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible to try not to be, but we can't fully be. But here's a perspective of it's actually can be really important. It can be really important that we stay neutral and really work with the client's autonomy if that's serving the right kind of purpose, if that's important. Uh, but what I'm hearing here, and I you know, very much agree with both angles, depending on the context, is, well, there are systemic issues that are oppressive. And there's a very good reason why we wouldn't want to stay neutral and we wanted to name things. Mm. Um, you, you talked about uh, coaching as a movement towards racial justice and equity, right? That uh, I really get the passion behind the role of coaching or some coaching or some coaches being of creating uh, that kind of change in the world and that there's a, asserting an influence because coaches have a lot of power, yeah. right? Um, if somebody trusts the coach or sees the coach as the expert, some coaches really get looked up to and, you know, there is a power dynamic of, you know, I'm sitting here and you really trust me and I can really influence your behavior and how you think. So I can, I can see this flip both ways. It's a lot of responsibility once we see the role of coaching as driving social change. So I'm, I wonder what you think about that. Yeah. Um, I think I'd go, I'd go a step back and say coaching is happening in the context of social change. Mm -hmm. So it needs to decide mm -hmm. which, which um, streams of change it wishes to serve because uh -huh. all the streams of change are not necessarily progressive. So mm -hmm. some streams in the social change process are regressive some are progressive mm -hmm. and progressive i mean serving like a general good rather than the narrow desires of a of, a, mm -hmm. an, of an elite could you give us some examples of different kinds of change that you know the All coach right. might get engaged in well well you know if, if coaching is like so let's take the climate change issue then or mm -hmm. i don't know financial stability because i you know if you think about the two moments where coaching as critique has really developed mm -hmm. after the 2008 financial crisis um um a book was written called rethinking i think it was rethinking coaching and it was asking the question what were the coaches doing in the financial so those coaches mm -hmm. who were working in the financial sector what were they doing what purpose were they serving while the CEOs and the financials and the um, and the um, I've forgotten what the CFOs or were, that they were coaching were were making decisions that led to this great crash and mm -hmm. all the economic and social pain that that caused across mm -hmm. across the globe. What were those coaches doing? And the Climate Coaching Alliance is asking the same question: Is mm -hmm. what are the coaches doing while the planet is burning? Mm -hmm. So. If you're working in and serving organizations and businesses as a coach, is your business or organization that you're working in, is it aligned to wanting to address issues of climate change or address issues of closing the gender pay gap or address issues of creating more inclusive environments for everybody to live mm -hmm. and be feel safe? You know, are we serving that or are we serving the status quo? Mm -hmm. um business as usual the pro pro profit is is god you know what i'm i'm i'm, I'm you <laughs> know i'm i'm <laughs> yeah, i get it i'm exaggerating a bit but just to make the point so you know we can either cash in the big books or we can be a bit more intentional about mm -hmm. how we coach because for those of us who are in the right um sec bits of the sector we can be making quite a lot of money mm -hmm. if we're in the right bits of the sector. Mm -hmm. um, coaching is booming. It's a booming industry at the moment, booming mm -hmm. sector at the moment. So there are, you know, there are those ethical questions as to which bit and, and, and the system which is being challenged by climate change and 
demands for equality and diversity, that system which is being challenged by these demands can either be just ticking boxes and um, making the right noises but not really changing anything or really changing something. Mm -hmm. And as coaches, we'll be able to get a feel for that. So we can either decide that we're only going to do the work that's really going to make a difference. It doesn't mean say we say no to the organisation, but we might contract with it to say, well, what you're asking me to do sounds okay, but I'm wondering if it might be more effective if we did it like this, like that, Mm. like something else, Mm -hmm. rather than just saying, wow, here's a great big contract. Let me sign up and... Let me sign up, do exactly (laughs) what they want. (laughs) Do exactly what they want. All right. Um, So it's about owning, I think. Again, it's about agency, isn't it? It's about Mm -hmm. owning our agency when we're contracting with with an organisation to do some work. We maybe have some... Not red lines because it sounds a bit like yeah. like war, but um, <laughs> and, and I don't like metaphors of war, um, even though I do sometimes slip into them myself. Mm. Um, it's you know it's about having those a sense of a, a moral compass or a set of values that we're transparent about, mm-hmm. um, and in, in taking the risk to be transparent. If people feel yeah. it's a risk, what I found in taking that risk to be transparent. You attract those people mm-hmm. who are serious about doing the work. Mm-hmm. You know, since I've been publishing and writing, what some people say is very brave and courageous. Me, I'm just doing what I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like to feel I'm speaking the truth, and this is the truth as I see it at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm attracting those people. I'm doing more work now than I've than I've ever done. I'm busier than I've ever ever been. Mm-hmm. Um, so this isn't. It's not like. I don't feel like I'm scaring people off and frightening <laughs> anybody. You know, the people who aren't interested aren't going to come near me because yeah. Well, <laughs> the people who are interested are coming. So, yeah. well, yeah. being being challenging or I mean, it's a good reminder for anybody who feel they needed it that the contracting stage of a coaching engagement is just so crucial, especially when it happens in organizations where a sponsor and not the person in the room says, this is what we want from you. This is what we want the coaching to impact. Uh, and it does take courage. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on the person, right? But uh, I, I'm assuming for most people, it takes courage to say, to not say, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> no, and it's... to say, uh, is that really what you want? Might there be other things? Have you thought about this? Uh, putting issues on the table that, you know, um, complicate the engagement yeah. and uh, offers more choices for this person who's willing to just give you their money right now if you just kind of go with it. Mm-hmm. And there's other coaches who are willing to go with it and take the money. Absolutely. Yeah. So. I, <laughs> I I think it's a courageous act to throw up some questions and say, is this really what you want to be working on? Is this wise? And we will have to bring in our own perspective and a systemic lens. And I think that's such important work to help somebody reframe the brief that they had already done. And yes, they might need to go back to some people in decision-making powers and say, hey, um, I've just got asked some interesting questions. I know I just, you know, should hire some coaches and give them some money and create this change. But now... I think there's some important questions we might want to discuss before we press the go button on this. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I I agree. I don't, I don't want to minimise, and I think particularly if you know, in a sense, I'm in a privileged position. I'm I'm late in. I'm relative. You know, I've had a first career. This is my second career. I'm not dependent on the income because I've I've got a retirement income from my first career. So I'm in a quite privileged position. I don't <laughs> have to say yes to any every contract that's offered to me. I think someone who's trying to build a life on the income and they've got a family to support and so on, it is more um, it is more uh, challenging, possibly. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I also think that we're living in a world where even if it starts as lip service, organisations are saying that they want to pay attention to these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want to have more inclusive workplaces. They want to avoid, even if it's at the bottom line, they want to avoid being sued. For, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good enough reason. <laughs> good enough reason. <laughs> you know, they, they want to be, they don't, they don't want to be sued because they violated some, somebody's protected characteristics. Then, you know, I don't think fear is always a good way to be moving <laughs> from, but at least it's a recognition mm-hmm. that something needs to be done. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
And again, I'm not going talking about going in there and standing on a soapbox or banging a drum. It's it's like you say, it's asking some questions and seeing how far you can go and how far you can you can take people towards meaningful rather than just tokenistic mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these things can't be done in one fell swoop or overnight. You know, it's, no. it's, it is it's um it's small steps, but some small steps can be quite transformational. So yeah, that. I'd love to go a bit more into the practical, and I think this might be a good transition. What can coaches do? I mean, you've you've uh, experimented with a bunch of different kind of structures. You've run critical, reflective, action learning sets, for example. There's a good article in recent mm -hmm. AC Perspectives. Um, what can coaches do? What tools do they have to employ to create this kind of change or um, create a space for these kind of reflective conversations well i you know i i feel that rather than starting with tools i think tools are important but i think a philosophical base is the mm -hmm. most important thing because i think if you've got um a, a strong philosophical and evolving philosophical base any tool can almost any tool can be used mm -hmm. um so what do I mean by that? So one of the things that I've that I've um, tried to systematize is a way of being mm -hmm. as a coach, which makes it OK for us to be political, <laughs> to have a social orientation, a political orientation. Um, and I mean those with small P's. I don't mean like alliances to a particular political party or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you were smiling when you said that. Was I? <laughs> How come you were smiling when you said that? <laughs> well, I don't. Maybe I was anticipating some some uh, challenge there. I don't know. But um, so political, so, so sort of socially conscious and politically conscious, ecologically conscious. So I mean, the Climate Coaching Alliance talk about being eco informed. So mm -hmm. I think we should be eco informed, politically informed economically informed we should understand economic systems we should understand the history of the, the human societies how mm. we've come to be come a, be a capitalist economy and a capitalist society mm. and what that means the role mm. of co colonial colon, col colonization mm. and coloniality as it's mm. after wow that's a lot that's a, that's a lot to acquire <laughs> but you can uh -huh. yeah you can of course we can acquire it Oh, in fact, if you have conversations with other people who've experienced these things, you'll acquire it. Mm, mm. You know, yeah, I mean, we're is... not talking about degrees here, right? We're talking no. about creating an awareness and uh, yeah. an understanding of yeah. how certain systems absolutely. work. You don't have so, to have a master's degree in each. Absolutely. In fact, I've created mm. a three-day course. I've, I've created a three-day course. Um, I call it Coaching for Social Justice, Decoloniality as a Systemic Lens. And that's what it does. It creates this awareness. And that awareness we choose how to relate to the things that we then become aware of and we integrate them into our way of being and that's mm -hmm. not going to be the same for everybody because we all experience the system in different ways um you know the metaphor i use is of, of decoloniality as a way of being is that the it's the the uh, the elephant i don't know if you, you know the parable of the blind men and the elephant uh, for those who don't know it it's quite an ancient can... parallel yeah. parable yeah so basically there's these men around you'll see the image if you google it on on uh if you google it on google um, <laughs> <laughs> um on any search engine um the blind man and elephant there's an image of a big elephant and these men at different points some are at the tail some are at the trunk mm. some are at the sides some are at the feet and all they can feel is that bit of the elephant that is within their reach. Um, so they don't know that it's an elephant that they're all feeling. Mm -hmm. They're all feeling bits of the same elephant, but they don't know that. When they start talking to each other and sharing their experiences, they get to see the whole elephant. Mm -hmm. And I see decoloniality as that conversation. The conversation mm -hmm. gets us to see the whole elephant, mm -hmm. but the whole elephant isn't a fixed thing. It's a changing thing you know elephants it's moving yeah yeah it's constantly moving changing 
you know, aging, dying, new reborn, rebirth. Mm-hmm. So it's a constantly evolving. So the conversation has to be constant. But our bit of it doesn't feel like anybody else's bit of it. Mm-hmm. But to know what the rest of it is like, we need to be in conversation. Mm-hmm. And it's that conversation which is important, that conversation across difference. And for me, that difference is is the thing that unites us. We are all diverse. Mm. You know, diversity is our, where it's, it's, it's inherent in all of us. Diversity mm-hmm. is inherent in all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, even if we're, we're members of a group, a group is not homogenous. Mm-hmm. Within a group, there is diversity. Um, so this, this idea of pluriversality, the pluriversal nature of reality is a key philosophical standpoint for me. And it's at the heart of decoloniality. Um, and that means that you, it's about your presence. So presence for me is the first tool. It's your being in relation to another person. That is your first tool Mm. your willingness to see all aspects of that person whatever it is that is relevant to the work that you're engaged in with them um and to create a space where they can bring as much of themselves as they wish to bring that is relevant to the work Mm -hmm. and not to feel that they've got to edit themselves some bits what can't be seen or won't be seen Mm -hmm. um And that you see them at the time when they need, when those bits of their identity or their 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 life experience need to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then tools follow. Huh. <laughs> tools mm-hmm. follow from that, you know. So the critically reflective action learning set process I developed first of all within that three day course, and now I offer it as standalone for group for group supervision and it's about building on what is already there Mm -hmm. so um, when I trained to be a supervisor we had two different models there's a seven-eyed model of supervision which a lot of coaches know from Peter Hawkins work Um, and for me it's about that our default because we are very tied to um, very individualized models of Mm -hmm. human psychology which Mm -hmm. focus very much on the individual rather than on the social supervision tends to extend to the psychodynamic and then doesn't go very much further than that. Mm. Yeah. In practice, not all of the seven lenses are active for supervisors. And and even Peter Hawkins admits this in in his latest edition of the book says that people in practice, it's very limited. So what I, uh, I've, I've developed this process, which I didn't create. I found it through some research, but I'm developing it. Um, in order to serve extending the lens Mm -hmm. because it it consciously asks you to zoom in and zoom out. Mm -hmm. So you zoom into the individual and the psycho, you know, the sort of relational psychodynamic, and then you zoom out Mm -hmm. to the socio macro, to the to the macro and the exo. So you go Mm -hmm. right out, not Mm -hmm. just to the organizational, but Mm -hmm. beyond that to the social and political and economic if necessary systems and there might be other models out there that people can use but this is the one that i'm i'm using um yeah so that's that's another tool that i'm developing but you know i use i've trained in many different i've trained in constellations practice um compassion and um the name of it now but anyway oh, yeah, compassionate yeah, approaches to coaching and you, you wrote yeah. about tara brack's work uh, yeah that's right and, yeah. and radical compassion, compassion yeah. i was curious about how that how that plays into the role of coaching and how that plays into your work when you work or supervise coaches or you know coach clients i know it's a big yeah, question think, yeah. <laughs> no you're getting me think about things that's always, always good um I think for me where that it's the link that Tara Brack makes between feeling and action. Mm -hmm. So compassion isn't just about feeling with and for. It's about 
taking that into responding to what what is being felt so mm. taking some action mm-hmm. um so uh, in a sense it kind of it's you know if i ever have this struggle with neutrality because i you know i'm not saying even though i'm quite clear in my sense myself about my relationship to this so called coach neutrality i do struggle with that borderline between the use of self and telling somebody something mm. i think it's something to pay attention to all the time mm-hmm. you know when am i being that somebody make judging when am i judging and when am i sharing awareness or sharing a, a, a data you might look at mm-hmm. it that way um and i pay attention to that borderline all the time but what helps me to do that is not just thinking about it it's feeling it's com- it's compassion um it's that it's that field of connection between you and the other person through that exchange of energy that we call emotion mm-hmm. um so it's it's an antennae it's it's an antennae it tells it tells me it yeah it tells and it directs unfortunately mm-hmm. that's the language that's coming i can't see it no, no other language is coming it mm-hmm. it's a it's like radar <laughs> uh-huh. um it tells me when something needs to is in need of attention uh-huh. um and so i i don't sit on it i respond to it mm-hmm. um don't know if that ex- answers your question so. yeah i think I think it does because I'm, I mean, for me, because I'm familiar with, uh, with Tara's work and also in the context of the coach sitting there, feeling something, responding to it. I mean, most coaches will see compassion as a vital part of the work, but I think it's so important that we, uh, pay attention to, well, what now? And like, so what and what now are two questions that were offered to me very early in my coaching journey by uh, Lucy Ryan. Mm-hmm. Uh, she said, these questions are so important because mm-hmm. if you just stop at awareness, then often nothing really happens. Absolutely. You know, and I think this is where a coaching conversation is different because the coach will actively encourage the client to think about, so what now? Mm-hmm. What, what are you going to do with this? Now that you're feeling this, mm-hmm. what changes mm-hmm. and how? Mm. And I think that's a really important space to create uh, because it's it's easy to feel something. It's actually hard to do something. Yeah, and I think this I think this is the difference between say empathy and compassion. You mm-hmm. know, compassion doesn't necessarily mean that you immediately have to throw your arms around somebody and comfort them. Mm. You know, someone could be sitting with you in tears. And the most compassionate thing might be to just sit there with them, not to move towards them, not, mm-hmm. you know, not to make that mm-hmm. empathetic sound or commiserate. It's just to sit in the presence of that emotion. Mm, be so with let them. It, yeah, and just be with them. And then when the time is right for them to process what needs to be processed mm-hmm. as them witnessing their emotion. Mm-hmm. So you help them to witness themselves mm-hmm. because in that witnessing position, they can then make a choice. They can decide they can, even if that decision is just to, to name something, to acknowledge something, to be mm-hmm. able to accept something, you know, before we started, you asked, you asked me about transformation. And one of the things that I have noticed is that people often come because they have a goal they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Um, And this goal might be they want a new job or they want this, they want something. There's something tangible they want. The transformation for them is to learn that actually the wanting something is displacing something else that is more important. Mm -hmm. It's displacing accepting themselves as who they are for who they are, mm-hmm. for attending to issues maybe to do with their relationship with their with their partner or their, their children or 
their work, their relationship with themselves, maybe even to pay attention to their relation because they're wanting something is a distraction rather than actual uh, um, uh, a meaningful a meaningful goal. Mm-hmm. And it's not that in the end they don't end up getting a new job, but they end up getting a new job from a place of greater groundedness mm-hmm. and a sense of. So transformation isn't is isn't isn't always about a thing achieving a thing. It's very often about a state of being, mm-hmm. um, a change in their state of being. Um, and I think this is a problem. I think with organisational change, if we're trying to help an organisation get a thing, mm-hmm. whatever thing that might be. We're probably not working at something that's going to be long, have any longevity, Hmm. because maybe it's the state of being of the organization that needs attention, not Mm -hmm. whatever thing, whatever target it feels it wants to hit. And that's where the transformation sits, right? That's why I love that you're encouraging coaches to go out there and acquire different lenses and have different kind of conversations and have diverse conversations and, you know, educate, inform, get exposed to all these ideas that are out there and how systems work, put different theoretical lenses on, zoom in, zoom out, you know, do your own work, inner and outer, you know, understand the world, understand yourself in that process. There's a lot of transformation there because Indeed. some of your status quos are inevitably going to get challenged. Mm-hmm. And some of these challenges you, you cannot undo. You, you just you transform because some paradigm shifts because you know stuff now that you cannot unknow or you've experienced something that you cannot unexperience. Mm-hmm. And then you're different. You're a different person. You see the world in a different way. You cannot go back because yeah. it's real. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot imagine a better place to stop, uh, but I wonder if there's if there's any words of wisdom, any encouragements beyond what you've already shared. Uh, if you think about coaches out there, new or experienced, um, what would you like to instill or what would you like to offer them? You know, we're going through challenging times and certainty is not so there it's sh- certainties are in short supply <laughs> so i think i think if i feel i've learned anything where I, where i feel that i've learned to be able to sit comfortably with discomfort and um i see that as a as a productive place to be it's not necessarily an easy place to be but it is productive um so i think the capacity to sit with discomfort to really pay attention to what's emergent and not be looking for fixed um sort of looking for fixed fixed things that might possibly be illusory anyway Mm. um you know, I find the emergent beautiful when I'm in an emergent space and emergent conversation. Um, I think there's a beauty there. So I think, you know, look mm-hmm. for the beauty in uncertainty and uh, mm-hmm. to be able to sit with that discomfort because it's pr- it productive energy. It is a productive energy. Um, I always think there's useful work going on whenever mm-hmm. there's a there's a degree of um yeah productive productive discomfort Mm. so um i think those those are the things i would i would say yeah productive discomfort i'm going to take that home the uh, (laughs) existentialist in me applauds (laughs) and celebrates (laughs) lovely uh shemaine thank you so much for making time i know you're doing a lot uh so i appreciate you coming on and i appreciate your views and i appreciate the work that you're doing because clearly it's going in a direction that is very very important and as you say, we have a lot of work to do. Um, if people wanted to uh, step closer into your sphere, find more of your work, um, maybe get supervised or uh, just be a part of what you're what you're doing, where where should they go? Where would you point them to? 
Um, well, there is my website. So my website, um, my company is called Life Flow Balance Coaching and Consulting. So www.lifeflowbalancecoachingandconsulting. They can find out from uh, my services there. But I also have a, a an open uh, community. Um, it's called the Philosopher's Stone Collective. Um, mm. So if you search Philosopher's Stone Collective or look me up on LinkedIn, um, you you will find um connections to to that community as well um it's currently free to join um so you can come along and see how you find it we work at decoloniality as a way of being that is our that's our mission statement mm -hmm. <laughs> um so uh, yeah those are the two places and and linkedin is is mm -hmm. a good place to to find me as well perfect once more thank you so much for making time thank you and uh My See pleasure. you around. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. To watch these episodes on video, make sure you also check out youtube.com slash animascoaching. See you back here soon.